thank uh, Christian Endress of the Conrad and Adenauer Foundation for sponsoring our webinars. And um, they are live broadcasting our event from upstairs there. We have new members of the Press Club, Tessa Dace, Jacques Dupria. Actually, I think we mentioned you, Jacques, last time, but anyway, welcome again. Neil Kish, Robin Kish, Dennis Lejeune, Mary Ann Lejeune, Keith Scott, Debbie Shab Shabason, Bertha Solsky, and Pat Stradum, and Roy Zazaraj. Um, we are hoping to have the former US um, uh, SA ambassador to the United States talking about Trumpism and Bidenism um, soon, um, but we'll keep you um, posted on that. And then early next year, we will have Douglas Scott on uh, Wikipedia's uh, growth over the last twenty growth over the last twenty years, I said twentieth anniversary in South Africa. Um, we welcome we welcome. John Steenhuizen, and as you know, um, he was elected the DA federal leader, the national leader, earlier in November. Um, and I remember him, uh, he addressed the press club a year ago uh, about, um, when he bounced unexpectedly um, into the acting leadership shoes and uh, his first engagement, I think, was here at Calvin Grove for the Press Club. Um, he's been in politics um, some for about 15 years, uh, entered the Etiquini Council, that's Durban, um, and was uh, leader of the DA in the uh, provincial legislature for a while before becoming a, a DA m member of uh, National Parliament about 10 years ago, uh, and served for a long time as uh, a chief whip and uh, Musi Mayamani. Um, I know that there's a, a, a clutch of by-elections coming up, and, and uh, the one in the city bowl area of Cape Town, perhaps uh, Mr. Tienhazen will be referring to that. We've also had a batch of by-elections, and I know that um, Mr. Tienhazen will be uh, looking at the an analysis, uh, doing an analysis of those results. Um, but we have asked him to, to talk today about the path to building a new majority. So, without further ado, a warm welcome to um, John Steen Hazen. Thank you very much, Donald, for that very, very kind uh, and welcome introduction. Uh, to the diplomatic corps, to our invited guests, to uh, ex-ambassadors in South Africa. I remarked to the High Commissioner that it could almost be a meeting of the United Nations, uh, everybody here today. And Donald, to say that it was a year ago about that I stood here and announced I'd be running for leader. Little did I know that the three-month race that it was supposed to be would turn into a year-long race. And I, I remarked, I think, to somebody the other day that I mean, I'm 44 years old and I was relatively exhausted after a year-long campaign. I don't quite know how Donald Trump and Joe Biden uh, have managed to battle it through uh, for their year-long campaign. But it's really great to be here today, and it's also really wonderful to see my excellent friend, um, somebody who I uh, grew up in politics at his knee, uh, Ambassador Tony Leon. And uh, it's great to have you here, Tony. And um, I was uh, the other evening at a function with Tony, and um, I described the history of the DA, and as you know, Tony was the first leader of the DA. So I said, well, Tony Leon was Genesis chapter one. Um, Helen Zilla was Genesis chapter two. Um, I skipped very quickly over Exodus, and uh, I'm now here and hope it's not going to be Revelations. <laughs> Colleagues, as we grapple to come to terms with the post-COVID, post-lockdown world, it's crucial that we don't let one crisis mask an even bigger one. And we do not let the extraordinary events of 2020 leave us confused as to which one came first and which is the more serious problem facing South Africa. The truth of the matter is South Africa was in desperate trouble long before COVID was anything more, or Corona was anything more than a Mexican beer that you shared with friends on a Friday night out. 
And while most of the world, indeed, and most of our African neighbors bounced back from the various maladies of the global financial crisis in 2008, we've been on a path of steady decline uh, during then, well over a decade, that has had nothing to do with outside forces or acts of God. And if anything, I think what the pandemic has done is shift attention away from the looming crisis in our economy and our society. It's given us all something else to worry about first before we get back to that other thing that had us so worried before we entered the lockdown. And crucially, even those who made zero headway with our faltering economy a very convenient scapegoat to blame for all our current woes, current and historic. We're now led to believe that had it not been for the arrival of coronavirus in March, we wouldn't be in this mess. And that our turnaround, which was just about to happen, has now been set back by years. This is all nonsense, of course, and anybody who has, uh, has any thinking ability would recognize this. By March of this year, before this, the first South African had tested positive, and before the first lockdown restriction had been announced, we were well into a deep economic recession. And most importantly, there was no sign of a turnaround on the horizon. We'd been relegated to junk status by the ratings agencies. SARS was missing very key revenue collection deadlines. And the state-owned entity dinosaurs were gobbling up multi-billion rand bailouts uh, at the expense of just about every other real government responsibility. None of that had anything to do with the first uh, the virus or the lockdown, although they have all been made infinitely worse from it. Every part of our decline, our dwindling GDP, our ballooning unemployment, our rising national debt, our falling tax revenue, and our parasitic state-owned entities, and our apparent insistence on repelling all international investment is entirely self inflicted. Despite our rich natural resources, our incredible infrastructure, our well-developed mining, agriculture, banking and tourism sectors, and a massive untapped and eager workforce, we've been lagging way behind our African peers for well over a decade. And we're doing so because of a stubborn refusal of our government to let go of an economic ideology that fizzled out and died in the rest of the world over three decades ago. The Berlin Wall might have fallen, the Soviet Union crumbled, and entire economies were reinvented and built from scratch, but our government here is still fighting this ideological war, like that lone Japanese soldier isolated on a remote Philippines island for three decades after the Second World War had ended. The belief that the state must be central to the economy, to the lives of the citizens, and that the state must own the land, the industries, and the monopolies, and that the state knows best where and how economic activity should be directed, is and remains the single biggest impediment to our progress as a nation. Yes, there are many other issues as well, and corruption is one of them, crime is another. But this is even rooted in, these problems are rooted in this unique worldview where many cadres of the liberation movement consider material reward to be the justified spoils of victory in war. Smatsen Gunyama was dead serious, an old friend of Tony's from Parliament. He was dead serious back in 2004 when he said, and I quote, I didn't join the struggle to be poor, unquote. And, with respect, I think he's spoken for many of his colleagues in the interceding decades. But government corruption is a symptom of the state-obsessed ideology. And you cannot solve it without obviously moving the massive incentive to loot a massively inflated and ineffective state through patronage and tender fraud. In short, what South Africa needs desperately now is sweeping reforms, 
a new agenda, a new horizon. We need to start reforming every single aspect of the state by taking power away from government, the incapable state, and putting more of it in the hands of the people of South Africa from whom it has been taken. You need to make the switch and understand that private sector, the private enterprise, are not the enemies and they're not the problem. The smart entrepreneurs and investors know far better than government does how to fill the needs in the market. And they are far more efficient at delivering goods and services. Just a fortnight ago, Elon Musk, who, like many of us in this room, uh, is South African, surpassed Bill Gates as the second richest man in the world through his company Tesla. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, would Elon Musk have been able to unleash the power of Tesla and the revenue of Tesla had he remained in South Africa? I would advance that with our incredibly destructive labor regime, with a government that is obsessed with red tape and control at every turn, it made it impossible, which is why South Africa has lost entrepreneurs like Elon Musk, like Mark Shuttleworth, and so many others who've had to go and hatch their dreams on far-flung continents rather than right here in their home country. We need to also admit that running power companies, airlines, broadcasters, is not government strength or primary focus. When these operate at a massive loss, the opportunity cost of them is absolutely devastating to our economy. Let's just look at South African Airways, for example. We're about to spend upwards of 18 billion rand on yet another bailout for South African Airways. That money has come from cutting frontline services, but it also comes at a massive opportunity cost. And to save the small number of jobs at South African Airways, we're potentially shrugging off the potential to create hundreds of thousands of new industries and new jobs right here in South Africa by using those billions towards youth entrepreneurship programs, funding education opportunities at both a basic and higher education, seed capital for entrepreneurs, giving it to cities to get powerful hubs of innovation. That is the opportunity cost. And we're essentially robbing the future of young South Africans to hang on to this ideological obsession of a state-owned airline that has not made a profit, will not make a profit, but remains a vainglorious testament to this clinging ideology uh, that the governing party can't shake off. We also need to realize that the market and international investors don't care about the backstory of South Africa. We are very proud of it. We think we're exceptional. But to the other countries in the world and to investors around the globe who look at us as an investment destination, that doesn't matter very much. And when we look at the investment deterring policies being preceded, the horsemen of the apocalypse, national health insurance, um, re, um, nationalization of the Reserve Bank, expropriation without, co without compensation, all these things are massive deterrents to the very investors we need to be thrusting open our doors to, to invest here in South Africa and help to grow our economy. This, coupled with an inflexible labor market, a volatile government policy approach, are deal breakers to most of these countries who don't mind taking a risk, but would not be mad enough to invest in a country where they see no future and no security. All of these areas can and need to be reformed if we're going to see results. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that this is a simple task. If it was, it would have been easy enough to do it a long time ago. It's rather like trying to turn a massive oil tanker. It doesn't happen easily or quickly. But the truth of the matter is we've hardly even begun to start turning the wheel yet. We have a government that does a lot of talking about the need to start doing so. But what we actually need is a government that's going to grasp it. And so, as a result, we continue to plow ahead in the wrong direction. Now, we were told at the start of the uh, 
uh, Ramaphosa administration that we had dodged a bullet in South Africa. Can you imagine what would have happened if the NDZ faction had got in? Because Mr. Ramaphosa had a wonderful reform agenda. If anybody in the ANC could crack this ideological mold, it must be this wonderful businessman who understood the market, who understood what international investors were looking for, who understood how to get the economy back on the right footing. And he certainly said all the right things. We heard about the new dawn, and alongside him we saw brave fellow reformers, Pravin Gordon, Tito Mbaweni, who were surely going to help us steer the ship of South Africa bravely towards this new dawn. But almost three years now into this administration, there can be no more illusions about the so-called reformers. Because every time they go out, they're yanked back into formation by the enemies of growth. None of the promised reforms have materialized. And instead of a new dawn, we've been staring expectedly at the same old horizon, crossing our fingers and praying for a miracle. Our recent further downgrade into double junk status confirmed that the much-vaunted reform agenda of the Ramaphosa presidency failed at its very first hurdle. Any talk of reform with his own party, any draft plan that puts some of the issues on the table is immediately shut down and we're left with the same old Cold War approach to the National Democratic Revolution. And we've seen it. And Minister Mbaweni, who seems to um, tweet a little bit more than Helen Ziller does these days, <laughs> shares things about the deep reforms that need to happen. He is very quickly pulled back into line by the people within his own party and his faction. Ah, Comrade Mbaweni, that's not what the National Council resolved. That wasn't what was agreed at Nazareth. That's not the policy of the ANC. And so each and every one of these attempts to give birth to the reform agenda is aborted by the enemies of growth that sit within the governing party itself. So when the president stands on national television and excitedly tells us about his economic recovery plan, the smart thing now to do is to actually wait for the finance minister to table his budget before you break out the champagne. Because that's when you start to see, in clear, spectacular technicolor, the very big difference and the big gaping hole between what is said and what is done. That's why you see the contradictions between the president's soothing words and the realities of the governing party's worldview as expressed in its budget decisions. Our problem is that our government deals in the politics of optics. Saying the right thing and pretending to move in the, same, in the right direction creates the illusion of action and it buys you just enough time until the next installment of the crisis wipes out those promises and those commitments from memory. Who remembers Tito Mbaweni's commitments around debt ceilings? Who remembers promises made on frontline services? Who remembers promises made on the huge jobs revolution that was about to be unleashed? And so we see the president promising us economic recovery plans, a president talking tough on gender-based violence and speaking about fixing our schools and bringing the dignity of water and sanitation to more communities around the country. While in that very same week, his finance minister is making budget cuts to police, to school infrastructure, all to pay for bailouts to our state airline and the other state-owned entities. All that comforting talk is nothing but a pseudo-remedy. As Tony said to me one evening, what the president is offering us is aromatherapy when what South Africa desperately needs is chemotherapy. But the good news, the good news, before you've all lost the will to live, <laughs> but the good news is that amidst all this doom and gloom, uh, we don't have to wait for the tripartite alliance to disintegrate before we, as the people of South Africa, can set our economy free. Just as the East Germans and the Soviets eventually put to bed the failed ideology uh, that had kept them trapped in abject poverty for so long, we too can walk away from the ANC's doomed project. We too can choose to throw off the yoke of a suffocating state control and step into the 21st century, albeit a couple of decades 
late. And by we, I mean the people, voters, because that is the only way to do this. The ANC cannot change its spots. For those of you who have not read last week's Mail and Guardian, I'm not often a big puncher of the Mail and Guardian, there was a startling admission in an internal ANC document that the party had become so moribund that the chance of turning it around was virtually impossible. That's its own admission inside its, our own governing party. It cannot change its spots. And the sooner we disabuse ourselves of that notion, the sooner we can commit to the reforms that South Africa needs. The so-called reformist presidency of Sir Ramaphosa was the best shot that the ANC have ever had, and yet it has fallen so short and has not come even close. So if the ANC won't get, let go of the ropes that are holding South Africa back, it has to be the people of South Africa who then let go of the ANC. And believe you me, many, many are ready to do so. I know the DA had a mixed bag of results during the recent by-elections, and we certainly didn't have the 2019 election that we hoped for. But when you look at the overall vote shed during the recent week of by-elections and in 2019, it's the ANC who was by some distance the biggest loser. A shallow reading of the by-election results shows that the DA had a net loss of seven seats. And while this was rightly described as a setback for the party, it doesn't tell the full story. While we lost seats to, among others, Good, the Patriotic Alliance, the Freedom Front Plus, and Al Jamar, and extremely difficult local sit conditions, and I must say, punished due to several faults of our own, our support grew among both black and white voters. In fact, our total loss of support in all the by-elections with the DA, ANC, and EFF fielded candidates was less than one percentage points from our 2019 levels. The ANC lost almost eight percentage points. But significantly, one of the wards which we won off the ANC, one of the few opposition parties that's winning wards off the ANC, was deep in the rural Eastern Cape, in a place called Walter Sisulu Municipality, which lies in the very north of the Eastern Cape province, almost on the Free State border. The ward in question includes Burgersdorp, Imzamomschle, and a rural district towards the Kharib Dam. It was in the two voting districts of Imzamomschle that the DA made its biggest inroads, enabling us to take that ward off the ANC. Now, not much was written about this, but to us it was very, very significant. If black voters in the rural Eastern Cape Ward could turn their backs on the ANC in favor of the DA, then it could happen anywhere. And it was always going to be a matter of when, not if, the struggle credentials of the ANC would eventually begin to fade. And the real life issues that affect South Africans on the ground every day would start overtake their historical allegiance to the governing party. And that's already happening. And it's a trend that is not going to be reversed. Liberation movements across the continent have shown us this time and time again. A lead role in the struggle only buys you a few decades. After that, you need to perform or you're out. And so the question we have to ask then, if the ANC is fading, what replaces it? If the ANC is facing the possibility of losing its majority in the course of the next election cycle, which is seeming more and more likely, where will the new majority in South Africa come from? And here the choice for voters comes down to two very clear and very distinct options. Do I still see a future for a united, diverse South Africa? Or is that dream no longer viable? And should I rather retreat back into a lager of racial, language, geographic, or religious uniformity? Now, there may be many options available to voters in terms of parties to choose from on the ballot paper, but the choice actually is about those two outcomes. Because every other major party in South Africa, apart from the DA, unashamedly flies the flag for one group of South Africans only, whether this is black South Africans, Afrikaners, Zulus, or Christians. 
As our economic situation worsens and tensions in society rise, the movement away from the center towards the more radical edges of the political spectrum will try and gain momentum. In difficult times, as we find ourselves now, it's really not that hard to appeal to people's fears and to then turn those fears into anger or hatred. And we're certainly seeing this across the world as the rise of identity politics and types of nationalism end up turning citizens against each other and against outsiders. Here at home, the recent ugly scenes in Brackenfell are a stark reminder of just how destructive this brand of us versus them really is. And that is why I'm very proud that our party has committed to building a united, non-racial and rational center in our politics. Because this is where the new majority in South Africa has to come from if we're going to have any chance of success. That is why our values and policies are written for all South Africans. Because we know that a majority brought together by a shared set of values and principles and a shared vision for our country is the only foundation to build a solid future. A majority built around a single identity, a single culture, a single race can never, ever achieve this. And that is why we proudly adopted the policy of non-racialism at our recent elective policy conference. Because we cannot fix the injustice perpetrated by the past by perpetuating the same divisions that caused the injustice in the very first place. In recent years, we haven't always honored this commitment. In our desperation to bring changes to metros like Johannesburg and Chwane, we compromised on our values by making concessions to the EFF. We cannot do that again. The DA's plans, and indeed our country's future, don't lie with a party like the EFF. Our values and our commitment to democracy to the rule of law means that there is a red line that we cannot cross. The EFF is moving beyond that line. For the DA, there's only one criteria of success that really matters, and that is the lived experience of citizens where we govern. If we compromise on this to accommodate a party that doesn't share our belief in democracy and freedom, we will have given up everything that sets us apart. If we're given the opportunity to govern in a city or town, it has to be felt that there is a significant change in the way in which it felt like under the ANC to what it feels like under the DA. That change was undeniable in places like Nelson Mandela Bay from 2016 to 2018. And it's been almost entirely undone these past two years following the treacherous coup by the ANC, UDM and EFF in Nelson Mandela Bay. But I'm happy to say that by all accounts, it looks like Nelson Mandela Bay will have a DA mayor and a DA-led coalition government again, hopefully in a matter of days or weeks. And that DA-led government's not going to sit around crying and complaining about everything that's happened the last two years. We're going to get out there and start to fix it because that's what South Africa needs. That's all that matters, and that's everything that the DA should be known about. We have a similar opportunity in Chwane to bring stability, accountability, and clean governance back to a city that has taken a beating since falling back into the hands of the ANC and its administrators. And what we do in these metros can become a blueprint for how we will build a new majority in South Africa. We will show that there is clear blue water between the DA and other parties on the, spe on the spectrum. We will show that running clean governments and shutting down the patronage networks makes a noticeable difference to the lived experience and service delivery. We will show that a meritocracy beats cater deployment every single day of the week. And we will show that the more power you take away from the incapable state and place in the hands of people, the more you free them up to live their, the ways, their lives, and the way they want to. We need to show that by devolving more power to provinces, to local government, and giving local people more say over their lives really will make a difference. And we will show that a party that speaks for all, cares for all, and is a home for all is the only way forward for South Africa. 
And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Please don't get me wrong. But it has to be done. Because that is South Africa's only hope. In the meantime, we will continue to perform our job in Parliament as the official opposition. And the only way that we know how to do it, and that is relentlessly, we will continue to hold government to account on every single issue and continue to push for reforms that everyone, including those in the ANC, know South Africa desperately needs. But what we're not going to do is get into the ANC's factional fights. Now, you don't have to be a political analyst to recognize that Thursday's scheduled motion of no confidence in President Ramaphosa is part of a counterstrike by Ace Magashule faction through its proxy project called the African Transformation Movement, headed up by Jimmy Money and others. And Newton's third law of motion is very clear. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And it's no coincidence that this motion that was languishing for four months below the line in Parliament was suddenly pulled above the line to be debated in the House the moment the legal heat was pushed up and turned on against Ace Magashule. Now, we're not going to play any part in a war for control of the ANC, and we will not support this motion. Our 84 MPs were not elected to go and pick winners and losers in the ANC. They were elected to Parliament to hold government to account and to pass legislation that will improve the lives of the people who have sent us there. And that is what we intend to do. So while the ANC and its proxies slug it out for control, we want to give President Ramaphosa a warning, as well as offer him an opportunity. President Ramaphosa, bring your reform agenda and table it in Parliament so that we can help you pass it. We've made this offer before, and I want to repeat it again. Because the president is fast running out of time. The enemies of growth are sitting around him, and as the heat has turned up on them, they too will start to move. They're going to do everything they can to scupper any reform agenda that the president would want to bring to the House. But the truth of the matter is, if the president was just to reach across the aisle, he'll find probably the majority that he needs to get his reform agenda on the table, firewalled, brought into law, and enacted by Parliament. Let him bring his reforms, and let him bring the votes of those in the ANC who back the reform agenda, and we will help him to pass them. He knows he can't trust half his party, but he doesn't have to. But the reality is that that window of opportunity is closing more and more every single day as these factions jostle for position. The president has to know that he has a target on his back and the sands of time are running through the hourglass very quickly. So he must use this window of opportunity now and put the country first and put his party second. That could be the very first step in South Africa away from decades of poor policy choices and even worse leadership. And it certainly would be the first step towards building a new majority in the center of our politics. A majority focused for the very first time ever on the needs of the people rather than the greed of the leaders. I think that would be really something. Thank you. <laughs> right, um, given that I've got the mic, I'm going to fire the first question. Uh, just reflecting on this uh, vote of no confidence in the President, um, isn't this a great opportunity to galvanize support behind uh, Cyril Ramaphosa and won't that sort of leave you as a party rudderless because there will be a groundswell um, in Parliament um, at a critical time? Secondly, the whole, the whole pattern in the by-elections still shows that the ANC dominates by-elections by 
and I, I, th I think the figure was over 50% that they got in these by-elections. So it looks as if we're going to have an ANC government for quite some time. Um, could you see your party going into coalition with the ANC um, in the next election? Okay. Do you want to answer one by one? Or, or? Okay, great. Thanks, Donald. So the vote of no confidence, well, I mean, it would be very odd for an opposition party to vote in favour of a confidence motion, which we're not going to do that because for all the reasons I've set out very clearly that we've not seen the required reforms, etc. But you require a, a majority uh, of members of the House to get a Section 102 motion through. And so without us voting in favour of it, it significantly reduces its efficacy and I think we'll put the President in a slightly stronger position. But as I said, you know, that window of opportunity is closing and that the enemies of growth are circling around the President closer and closer every single day. And again, I mean, who, I mean, who would replace him if he was to lose a motion of no confidence? I certainly have no confidence in Mr. Mabuza or any of the other members sitting on those benches. And so we won't play parts of, of that particular game. Of course, the ANC still dominates in a number of aspects, but that is a waning dominance. And we've seen it in every single election since, I think, apart from 99, where uh, I think Mbeki had a, a bit of a jump when the economy was doing so well. The ANC have gone down in every single election. People have also said, well, the ANC will never split. It has split several times before. Uh, the UDM is a split from the ANC. COPE was a split from the ANC. The EFF was essentially the youth league splitting away. And each time one of these cleavages happens, I believe it opens up great opportunities to bring them below 50%. And so the new majority that I talk about has to include people who we're not doing business with already. But it cannot be the ANC in its current form. It cannot be us doing what the MDC did to prop up Mugabe, who then promptly turned around and destroyed the project from a new center of power. It has to be a coming together of building a new majority that is hinged on one thing and one thing only, how we get South Africa off this low growth, high debt, high unemployment trajectory and onto a new path to prosperity, particularly for the 30 million South Africans. So I think if we can build a new majority with people who share the values and principles, who share the vision of a prosperous South Africa that is working, that is fixing broken institutions, and that is delivering services, I think that there exists a huge opportunity because, frankly, the alternatives are too terrifying for words. And as I see it, there are two alternatives. Alternative one is that we just continue with the same effect. The ANC you know, getting you know, just above 50%, limping on for another five years, negative growth again, more ratings downgrades, greater suffering. And eventually, we're going to run out of money, even more so than we've done already. And the real trouble will come to South Africa then when people go and take their SASA cards to find that they're empty. And that's when South Africa is going to face a huge problem going forward. The second alternative is that there's a coalescence around the radical left. And you only need to look at what happened in Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and other places around the world to understand what the implications that of those are for South Africa and the people of South Africa, most notably the poor. Right, we'll take two questions. Uh, ambassador Leon. Uh, nothing as X as an X, both as an ambassador and as the leader. But uh, first of all, John, you know, congratulations threefold on your election, on that excellent speech, both a tour de horizon and I think a tour de force. It really was excellent, if I might say. So, having praised you, let me... Uh, Damn me. No, not damn you. <laughs> so, uh, I guess a lot of people in this room, just looking around, are probably supporters of the party and have been for many years. And what unites everyone in this room, whatever their views are, is they're all residents of the city of Cape Town, self-evidently. And you quite correctly pointed out to the misgovernance, the malperformance of the ANC, where they've taken or retaken control in Joburg and PE and Pretoria Chwani. But, um, you know, going back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, when I was in charge, we took control of the city of Cape Town as a party way back in 2006. So the DA has been in government here for 14 unbroken years. It's a long time. 
So my question is, uh, a lot of people, I don't know whether they're in this room, are very dissatisfied actually with the DA governance in Cape Town, with the leadership, with the performance officials, and I'm not going to bore you or embarrass you, the list that you might be aware of. And there's going to be a municipal election next year, and all these folk here are going to have a say in it. What can you do as the leader of the party, or if you actually think there's a problem in Cape Town, to improve uh, the leadership and governance in the city of Cape Town? Sure. I think we'll just take that question now. Great. Thanks very much, and thanks, Tony, for the question. And I uh, know as, uh, as your uh, ward councillor emeritus, uh, I, I do get to hear your, uh, your concerns around the city. And look, I share, I share many of these concerns. I think that the, that the level of service within the city of Cape Town has deteriorated, and it's marked in a number of, uh, a number of areas, just driving around the built environment and looking at streets that used to be swept regularly. And I think it's, it's been the victim of precisely the scourge of what afflicts South Africa, and that's the centralization of power. Now, when you were the leader and we took over the city of Cape Town, the first move that we made was to uh, develop sub-councils, uh, which set to devolve power down to local communities. We had uh, Section 79 committees that were meeting regularly. And unfortunately, there was a project started by someone who's no longer with the DA called the ODTP, which is basically a redesign of the organization of Cape Town. And what it essentially sought to do was to suck up all of those powers into the mayor's office, including even the ombudsperson. I mean, I don't know a single city in the world that has an ombudsperson who's supposed to be exercising oversight of the executive authority as a functionary in the mayor's office. And Section 79 committees were no longer meeting regularly. Sub-councils had a large part of the local decision-making uh, abilities from town planning to liquor legislation stripped from them. And these were then centralized. And you had this ridiculous design where you know, many mayors and MACO members, this and area MACO members, and it's created a complete mess that I think has really damaged the ability of the city to be able to deliver effectively and efficiently as it used to. And so one of the things I've engaged with Mayor Plato around is how we dismantle that centralization, how we give power back to those sub-councils, how we focus on you know, allowing local decision-making into there, and then putting the budget towards it. I mean, it makes no use sitting on huge reserves in the city of Cape Town while you can't put a pump in the Milderton Lagoon and you can't you know, get the very basics of local government right. And so I've said to all of our governments, every single one of them, and I've visited with every single one of our metro caucuses, that I want DA-led metros to look like maternity wards. There must be delivery every single day, lots of them, and I want lots of pictures where we're sharing with people what those deliveries look like. And I will be holding those governments accountable. So I've put them on terms that we'll be watching their progress, not wasting time on three-year, five-year plans, about what their plans are for the next six months, what their plans are for the next year, so that we can start to make those meaningful differences. Because, as I said earlier, it's no use talking about it. You know, it's no use being good you know, if you aren't, or saying you're good if you aren't. It's no use you know, saying you deliver better if you don't. And when something damages your brand proposition like that, it leads to that dissatisfaction. So we're going to do better, and we're going to make sure that those DA governments start to deliver in a far more effective, efficient way and focus on spending money where it's needed the most, which is ensuring you have strong operational budgets that are cleaning up city, but then rolling out capital infrastructure projects to those cities that need the bulk infrastructure, uh, etc. There's a question at the back there. Brian Hopkins. Um, hello, John. And welcome, and congratulations on your leadership win. Um, you mentioned only briefly, and very briefly, unemployment. You mentioned the importance of voters, and how voters are going to see your success or lack of success next year particularly. But what I'm really concerned about is the voters have one thing surely in mind, which you haven't stressed, and that is jobs. They need jobs and particularly young people between the ages of 17 and 25, where there are 10 million young people currently unemployed, and we have another million joining the workforce in January, 
having either matriculated or failed after a COVID-stricken year. What is the DA's plan to motivate, activate, and do something about this most disastrous um, aspect of our economy and our country? It cannot be allowed to continue. Mm. We'll take a question from Jan Jan next. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Stenhausen, I think we were all glad that if and when this uh, Nelson Mandela Bay um, metro change comes to pass, you say time will not be wasted in blaming others. I think you came perilously close, though, in your answer in Cape Town. You've been um, without Mrs. DeLille now for more than a year, so it's perhaps high time to not blame her. Um, but I wanted to ask a few questions arising from your speech. Um, the first is whether you think that there are any of the woes that the DA has encountered in um, municipal by-elections that can be blamed on the DA itself. The party tends to say that it has learnt lessons, but it tends not to list them. What lessons have you learned? Secondly, I see that in the upcoming by-elections on the 9th of December, you are defending two wards in Benoni, um, where you had rather North Korean majorities, but you are being opposed by the former councillors who have gone over to Mr. Mashaba, but of course <coughs> cannot join his party because it hasn't been registered, so they are standing as independents. The one ward is in North Mead and the other is right next door in Faramir. This is DA Heartland. What would you expect to be a an acceptable showing, and what kind of showing would surprise you as being a bit low. And then finally, you said that you are ready to work with parties who share your vision and your dedication to freedom and democracy. Which parties, pray tell, are those? Good question. Yeah. Great, thanks so much. Brian, of course, and absolutely, unemployment, I would say, is probably one of the biggest in fact, if not the biggest issues, and it's top of the mind, certainly, of the majority of voters in South Africa. But again, the heart of it lies at the, at the you know, this centralization of state control that adopts government, uh, job-killing legislation that makes it very, very difficult, disincentivizes companies from being able to take on um, young people into their businesses, uh, that a labor regime that's designed for a you know, a, an economy that we'd like to have down the line, but not grounded in the reality of the economy that we have. I mean, I'd love to be able to wear a size 34 pants. The reality is I'm a size 36. And, you know, that's how it, that's how it goes. And so, um, you know, we've got to have a, we've got to have a, labor, a labor regime that is suited to our current circumstances. We're also not attracting investment and the type of investment that is required to absorb the large part of it. We have, well, we have now, I think, the highest unemployment in the world. We have the highest youth unemployment in the world. We have become an outlier in many of these instances. But the reality is that the majority of those who are unemployed are actually unskilled. They're unskilled. So we can bring in high-tech jobs, but those are not the factory jobs, the, you know, the unskilled labor jobs that we need if we're going to absorb those people uh, that need to be absorbed into labor while we focus on rejigging our education system to start preparing young people for the economy uh, that we're facing. And the truth of the matter is, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. South African schools are, are still teaching sort of you know, stuff out of the Iron Age uh, in, in many instances. And the quality of education is hopelessly leaving South African children behind, unable to compete in a more competitive global environment. So I think it's, I think it's a function of two things. It's about creating an investor environment that attracts the manufacturing jobs that we need to get the economy stimulated, that are going to put people into employment. There's no bigger leveler, no bigger equality builder than a job, than a, a salary coming in where somebody can you know, feed their family, pay for the school fees, pay for the municipal services, be able to improve their lives. And yet at every turn, those who are the job creators in South Africa are trodden on, either through, if you're not being tied up in red tape, you're being tied into collective bargaining decisions 
for which you were never even part of, sitting around the table. And the great irony as well is that there is the biggest protection racket going on within the tripartite alliance because the unions who represent employed South Africans have a seat at the top table. There's nobody at that top table speaking for the unemployed. And that's why whenever you talk about a youth wage subsidy or a basic income grant, all these sort of things, the, 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 it is the unions that put the kibosh on it because their job is to protect the employed, you know, not the 30 million South Africans living on less than 998 rand a month. So we're gonna break that cabal that is the, and that insider outsider economy that exists there and you've got to do it by smashing the power of the state by dramatically reducing the power of the state and then getting government out the way to unleash entrepreneurs to unleash those people who understand how to make businesses work how to grow a, a business how to bring people into employment and we've got to incentivize them and we've got to incentivize them to particularly take in um, younger south africans into through uh, tax breaks through uh, tax incentive grants and, and the like. And we have then had the huge opportunity, I also believe, in breaking up our SOEs to be able to unleash jobs revolutions. And I think here particularly of an SOE like Eskom, which I think offers a huge opportunity if we can smash the monopoly of you know, the, this dirty power um, uh, that we have generated through coal in South Africa and start moving boldly into independent power producers and the like, I think we'll unleash a greenfield industry in South Africa that could become a huge catalyst for employment within South Africa. Instead, we stubbornly hold on to these failed models having to be plowed money into more and more. The truth of the matter is we're not going to get people into employment, real employment. So when I'm talking about jobs, I'm not talking about what gets announced in Parliament. We've created 800,000 new jobs, which in essence, is often toch labor. It's uh, two days a week, you know, cleaning ditches, you know, uh, working for water. It's not a sustainable income. And ironically, government has exempted itself from paying the minimum wage for those people that it expects businesses themselves to pay. And so we've got to break the stranglehold that the state has on everything in South Africa and give power back to the people. That includes uh, giving them back the economic power. Um, Nelson Mandela Bay, Yan Yan, to be fair, I, I have a, a slight disagreement with you. I think when a system has been designed and is, you know, has, been, has had such a terrible effect, it does take time to dismantle it. And you've had government departments uh, merged, you've had directorates merged, you've had all power sucked up into a mayor's office. It's very difficult in a year to just simply turn that type of thing around. But I know that the city is looking at the delegations, looking at giving power back to sub-councils and the like. But we can't simply pretend that what happened under the you know, four previous years didn't happen. And as you've heard, it has had an impact on service delivery. And you can see it. You can see it because you don't have the efficiency and effectiveness that was there. And the city leadership is aware of it. And that's why they're intervening, fixing potholes, getting the robots done, you know, running, spending the biggest amount on dealing with homeless people out of any metro in the country, setting up shelters so we can get people off the streets and into opportunity. And I had the great pleasure of visiting many of them uh, on uh, Mandela Day this year with our councillors to look at the incredible work being done to rehabilitate street people and get them back onto ground. What are the lessons learned, Yan Yan? Yes, of course. I'm not blaming everybody else for the DA's woe, as I've said it many times. We've also got a lot to answer for. And I think the internal report that was compiled by the panel that took a very honest, hard look at where things had gone wrong and what had happened, uh, it was unprecedented in South African political history. Not only did we commission the report, but it was then made public so that we could you know, hold a mirror up to ourselves, but also tell South Africa that we've heard you. You've sent us a message. We've heard you. We've messed up. We've made mistakes. We've tried to be too many things to too many people. We've walked out on our values and principles. We've betrayed you. And Lanasia is a very good example of that because I had the opportunity to go and do door to door in those wards in Lanasia. And the people there are angry. And let me tell you, if I lived in Lanasia, I probably also wouldn't have voted for the DA in this last election because essentially what happened is that the city, under the DA administration, 
allowed unbridled land invasions to happen all around in Asia, has destroyed the property values there, failed to uphold the rule of law, and protect the rights of residents there. And they punished the DA for that. And, you know, I think that's it's a healthy thing in democracy. When you mess up, voters must express themselves. And it's given us pause for thought to look back and say, well, this is precisely why you must never walk out on your values and principles. Why your fund, when you lose your mooring, that you drift all over the place and you get end up being washed onto reefs as we were in a place like Linasia. In terms of the uh, wards in Ekuleni, of course, I mean, there's a tough environment there, but those people who left were themselves subject of internal hearings within the party. And I've made it very clear that we cannot go out and hold an ANC government to a standard to which we are not prepared to hold ourselves and our own public representatives. So if we lose by-election wards because we've got rid of corrupt people, it is a price I'm prepared to pay. And a good example is George, where for the very first time, you had full-blown ANC-style corruption in George municipality under a DA mayor, ably assisted by four of his councillors. Now, we had a choice. We could continue blithely, continue in control of the, of the municipality, and hopefully, you know, by the time the Auditor General realised what was going on, by the time the Hawks woke up eventually, that, you know, something would be done about it. Instead, we took decisive action and held people accountable. We didn't tell people, step aside, and then when they didn't say, okay, well, you don't really have to step aside. We got rid of them. And if we have to pay the price of losing wards to ensure that the DA goes back to being very clear to voters what we stand for and what we're about and what they can expect from DA public representatives, that is a price I'm prepared to pay because I think in the long term, Voters are going to look at a party and say, well, this is a party that doesn't talk about accountability. It's a party that practices accountability. And I think the accountability deficit in South Africa is a large part of why we sit here in very, very difficult uh, circumstances. So, as they say in the classics, a win is a win. I'll be happy to retain the wards because I think it'll send a very clear message that you can leave um, for whatever reasons you do, but you know, we will make sure that we prevail, and I happen to think that Ekuleni is one of those metros that does offer huge opportunity for the DA and the local government elections next year. And I've no doubt, like in Durban North, like in Peter Maritzburg, in this last run of by-elections, that our core voters are going to come out and vote for us again because they're seeing a party that has accepted its made mistakes, that has set about rectifying those mistakes, and is now clearly back on the path uh, towards building that new majority in South Africa and bringing more South Africans towards that horizon of hope and away from this terrible dawn of despair that's been visited on the people of South Africa. Right, there's a question around the corner from you here. Um, good afternoon, John. Um, I sit here and I like your arguments and I like all the rationale and it finds fertile soil. And I think that's... A, I can talk for everybody in the room here. We all like to hear what you're telling us. But <clears throat> as Bill Mayer says, Democrats have good arguments, but they don't know how to win. And South Africa is in deep, deep trouble, and I don't need to explain that to you. And we can no longer afford the kind of incremental changes that we're doing now. And unless the DA can appeal to the masses, they're never going to win. So, you know, just uh, top, of the, top of my head, the ANC have stolen 1.5 trillion. Yeah, there are a couple of things that need to be addressed. Expropriation without compensation. Proper sewerage for people. Housing. Why does the DA not say to us people that, that, that you, you appeal to? Listen, we need to address that. We, we're going to raise 1.5 trillion and we're going to spend it on that voter population because we need to win that vote. At the moment, with all the beneficiaries on all the government grants, they're not going to vote for Christmas. Turkeys are not going to vote for Christmas. So we need to look at a different way of getting those numbers. 
Sorry, I know that's not DA policy, but you know, I'd like us to turn the whole thing on its head. And it absolutely yeah, is DA yeah. policy. It absolutely is DA policy. And that's what I find so utterly frustrating about a lot of the analysis around the policies which we adopted at our recent policy conference. Because what we're saying is we want to be the voice for the very people in South Africa who don't have a voice. And those are 30 million people living below 998 rand a month, 99.7% of whom are black South Africans. They're the ones that are the ultimate outsiders in this economy. They're locked out of, uh, out of opportunity. They're trapped in poverty. And let me tell you, I've just done a road trip from Cape Town to KwaZulu-Natal through the Eastern Cape. If you want to see the failed state that's coming South Africa's way, do yourself a favor and drive through places like Aduchwa, um, Lusiki Siki, Flagstaff, Bazana, Port St. John's. You will see what happens uh, in the failed state. But wrapped around every single post office in a concentric spiral in each of those little towns was hundreds upon hundreds of people queuing to get a grant in the pouring rain, in the boiling sun. And when you speak to those people, they don't want to be on grants. They want an opportunity to be able to have a job. They know that there's not much you can do with 350 rand a month, that the old age pension is hopelessly insufficient to be able to provide. And so I think that there's huge traction for us to be able to go out now and say, well, we are the party, not speaking for the employed, not speaking for people who've got a seat at the table already, but speaking for you, you who is living in, living in poverty, you, the mother whose child is sitting in a class with 52 other children with a, a teacher that can't wait to knock off to get to a Casalto meeting, in a neighborhood where after 7 p.m. people have to eat dinner under the table because of gangsters' bullets flying through the window, of the husband who hasn't had the dignity of work for six years. Those are the people this party wants to be. There's 30 million of them. If we can just get a fraction of those, I believe there's huge traction for us to be able to do it. And it's about going out there, and that's why I've committed this party to being a party that is on the ground. It can't be a party that exists in the airwaves or in parliament or in councils or legislatures. And that's why we're going back to basics. Activism, branches, and campaigning. We're going to be, have branches in every municipal ward in the country. We're going to run local campaigns that matter to local people. Not talking about in Kandla and talking about how great Cape Town is, but saying the reason that you're having to skew up in this undignified manner every month is because you've got a wholly insufficient and inefficient system. We don't want you queuing every month. We want to get you a job. We want to get you into a decent house. We want your, school, your child to have a, an opportunity at a decent school. I think there's huge potential out there for us to grow the party massively by speaking up to the, for those people who don't have a voice and speaking to them in their communities. Not parachute in just before an election and expect people to vote for you. We've got to be authentically rooted in those communities. And that's why we're going to have a branch in every ward. We're going to make sure we've got activists from within that community that are doing it. And I've said to my party, I'm willing to lead the way. Because some of my MPs said, well, there's some deep rural areas you can only get on horseback. I've said, you get the horses, I'll come with you, and we will set up a branch in that community. And that's how we're going to do it. We're going, to do it, we're going to do it through winning hearts and minds and speaking up for the people who for far too long have been. And I think that that is going to offer us the best opportunity for growth. And the great thing about that is that when we speak about you know, non-racialism and focusing policies on the 30 million people who live below 998 rand a month, you automatically cut out the fat cats who benefit time and time again from the government policies. And we saw it, there's no better example of it than what happened during COVID with this feeding frenzy. And it was, it was the same people, the same names that pitched up during state capture, that pitched up under the Guptas. It was Numvulo Mokanyane, it was Gwede Mantash, it was you know, uh, Zwane, it was Bongo. All these same people are the same people who time and time again benefit at the expense of the 30 million people who don't have the access to power who don't have the inside track. And those are the people I want our party to be speaking up and speaking out for in everything we do. Not just shining a light, showing people how bad things are, but saying to those people, we understand why you live this way and as our plan to make it better going forward. Thanks. Chalk from the 
Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to you next. It's Jacques next, and then we'll come to you. Um, Jacques from the FW de Clark Foundation. John, thanks for your words. Um, we, you, having met you, you certainly don't strike me as a political party leader who will openly threaten, like some other political party leaders, the police um, brazenly in their homes uh, with door-to-door -door visits and such. We've seen political party leaders getting away with saying a lot of things. Uh, divisive conduct, I don't need to go into the depths of that. We've also seen what the former president recently uh, did at the Zondo Commission, um, literally flipping Deputy Chief Justice Zondo, the proverbial bird. Um, and, and, and commendable is the conduct of, of the Deputy Chief Justice. My question to you, how do we as South Africans, in, in, in all our walks of life, but also how is the DA, looking to address what, what, what one can only see as a growing sense of, of impunity amongst high-placed leaders in South Africa and throughout South Africa. This real sense that, well, you know, I can just get away with absolutely anything. I mean, for me as a lawyer myself, I think our courts, uh, right up to the Constitutional Court, have, have done exceptionally well, considering what they have to deal with, because ultimately it seems that that would unfortunately be the last place that these, these things would turn. But what are we... What are we doing and what, what can the DA do to, to address this sense of, of real impunity um, that, that we see committed so brazenly? Thanks. Great. And thanks, Jacques, for that question. And let me be very clear. Um, when every member of parliament takes an oath of office, they stand on the floor of the National Assembly and before the Chief Justice, they swear to uphold the Constitution of the Republic and uh, of South Africa and all laws of the Republic. When people threaten violence and do so in such a destructive way, that can cause real harm because some of these leaders are demagogues and people hang on their word. They regard it, when they say attack, they regard it as a legitimate order and instruction. And they do it, and we've seen it happen. And I've said very clearly that you know that Mr. Malema is the only opposition politician in the country who has a police security detail two cars, four officers, paid for by all of you. And so I've said to him very clearly, if you hate the police and you want to declare war on the police, why don't you start by discarding your police blue light brigade that follows you wherever you go? The rest of us have to you know, hide behind Yan Yan in Parliament when there's a problem. You know. Not him, he's got police protection. The very same police that he's telling people to go into their homes and deal with them. Outrageous. And it is that hypocrisy that we've got to call out continuously in South Africa. You don't say, one day I'm going to kill for Zuma, and the next day say, I want to send a bill to Zuma. And that is exactly it. You don't say the public protector's findings are binding, and then ignore the public protector's reports into you. And we've got to stand up against that. And it is an, a worrying trend, because you've seen what Kebi Mapatso said I think just 48 hours ago, that if Mr. Zuma is arrested, there will be blood on the streets, that there will be war in South Africa. We all know the circumstances of Mr. Mapazzo's situation, and uh, I'm not sure how well he'd terribly do in war, but nonetheless, there it is. But probably about as well as Karl Niehaus would. Um, but yeah, but here's the thing. You can't have leaders in society threatening violence. We've seen what road this takes us down. It takes us to Rwanda. It takes us you know, down, down genocides, and we've got to break that cycle of violence. As I said, during the farm, uh, the tensions that came up during the farm attacks, it was, I think it was Martin Luther King who said, if we adopt the policy of an eye for an eye, the whole world will be blind, and it benefits nobody. So what do we need to do? Well, we've got to have a consequence framework in South Africa, because the very reason that people like that are allowed to get away with it for so long, and believe you me, I think it started under Tony, we've spent millions and millions of rands over a decade just trying to bring Mr. Zuma the one thing he's always wanted, which is his day in court. And he spent every effort trying to avoid it. And, you know, you've, we've got to do it because if you don't have a consequence framework, then the culture of impunity sets in. And when people see the fish's head getting away with it, I can tell you the tail's going to get up to things that you wouldn't even believe possible. And so that's why we said we can only take you seriously 
when the protagonists go to jail. Because it's always the, the small fish that pay the price. You know, it was the colonel at Waterkloof. It was the public works officials at Encanta. You know, it was, you know, uh, a diary clock, um, you know, in, with this military jet to Zimbabwe. It's always somebody down the line. And we've got to make sure that we deal with this ANC problem. Absolutely no consequences. How do you deal with it? Well, by making sure that, A, you have a consequence framework, and we do, the MFMA, the PFMA, all of these are, you know, pieces of legislation, the Public Audit Act, all great pieces of legislation with teeth. They're just never enforced. And making sure that you put your money where its mouth is, or your, your money where your mouth is. So if you're serious about tackling corruption, why don't you give far more to the NPA rather than to South African Airways? Why don't you establish a, re-establish the Scorpions? a multidisciplinary task team that had, I think, a 90-odd percent conviction rate. That's how you create a consequence framework. And you know, you only have to put a few high-profile heads on spikes before the message goes out that there's a new sheriff in town and that things are going to be different. And that's when you start it. If you allow the culture of impunity to set in, people see others getting away with it, it becomes like a cancer in your organization and in your state, and it just eats and runs wild throughout your entire organization. And so that is why clean audits are important. It is why spending money where it matters and on people, not politicians, is so important. And so we shrug off every year. The Auditor General brings in these disastrous audit reports, and there's never consequences for those municipalities. Where's the top slice for the salary bill there if you don't get a clean audit? If you are a municipality, there's some municipalities in this country that have not had a clean audit since the day they were established in 2000. They've had disclaimers every single election. One day of bad headlines, they go in peace and no more, carry on stealing, and when you're caught, you just jump to the next municipality. No consequences. And so I think as citizens, we need to start becoming more assertive and active around demanding that more money is being spent on, these, on, the, on the agencies that are really going to have the teeth to make sure there are consequences for these things. So let's give Shamila Batoy the 18 billion rand instead of giving it to South African Airways. Then you'll start to see some real movements. Then you'll start to see some people where they belong, which is behind bars and not the ones in parliament. Right, there's a question at the back. The sound man will be there. Uh, good afternoon, John. My name is George Gombe. I don't represent anybody. I am here just as an individual. Uh, I'm an IT specialist and I'm not affiliated with anybody. Uh, I thank you for a very informative afternoon and uh, you strike me as a stand-up guy who's got his act together and has thought it all out. However, I do have one question for you. Let us suppose, let's play a what-if game and fast forward a couple of months and let's say that by, by some unimaginable event you become the next president of South Africa. If that should be the case, what I would like to know from you is how you would deal with the elephant in the room. You've touched on it briefly, but we've not drilled down to the specifics. What I'm referring to here is the pandemic. Now, I very much like the future that you describe for us, and I hope we all attain to that. But we have to live long enough to reach that promised land. And quite frankly, between now and then, we have got the sword of Damocles hanging over our head. To come back to my question, should you be the president of South Africa in the next couple of months, how would you confront this immediate urgent problem of the pandemic? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, and um, I invite you to visit our website because we've got a very detailed plan called the COVID-19 Action Plan for the Incapable State, which we, as a party, uh, during the crisis, decided that we would be solutions-oriented. And so right from the very first week of the pandemic, after my initial meeting with the President, we submitted what we called our Blue Book on government's response, which looked at every ministry and what it should be doing to prepare for the coming crisis. After that, we realized that by week three, when more people would be died from police brutality than from the virus itself, when um, you had a situation where people, we realized that whilst lockdown and self-isolation may be possible in uh, large parts of Europe and other parts of the world, it just simply is not a reality for many people in South Africa. 
It is impossible to self-isolate in a wooden iron shack with nine other people. It's impossible to self-isolate in a two-room RDP house, particularly when you don't have a freezer, where every day you're out there eking out a living. And we saw what happened when you know, people had to go out and earn a living. That woman you know, trying to sell Acha in Dobsonville in Soweto, who was arrested for just trying to be able to make some money that you could put on the table. So whilst the initial three-week lockdown was the right thing to do, and we supported it, it became very obvious that in the long term, it wasn't going to be a viable option for South Africa. And so we, we put forward our smart lockdown model to government, and I think had the testing, tracing, and tracking been up near the levels that it, well, it should have been, I think it would have been a, a far more constructive way to deal with it than keeping the lockdown. We now are in one of the longest and hardest lockdowns in the world. And so when we realized that after seeing what had happened in places like Gauteng and the Eastern Cape, and I think it was probably best uh, typified the difference that while we were building field hospitals here in the Western Cape, in Gauteng they were digging graves. While we were buying PPE here in the Western Cape, people were buying scooters in the Eastern Cape because it was a feeding frenzy. And so we put on the table our plan for how we would deal with it. And it involves dramatically increasing your testing capabilities, building field hospitals so that you can deal with any overflows or uh, pressure on the medical system. But the biggest killer in Africa and in South Africa is actually poverty. Poverty is the biggest killer. And I really do believe that many people are going to be affected for far longer and far more deeply by the economic impact of what lockdown, the hardest, longest lockdown in the world, has done to the sovereign economy than the virus ever would have affected. Now, that's not to say that we must say, go back to business as usual and pretend the virus doesn't exist. Of course, we've got to manage it. And we knew that from the beginning. We knew this was going to be a 12, 14, 18 month process. We could never keep South Africa locked down for that. It just simply would not be possible. We didn't have the government reserves that other advanced economies had to be able to bridge their people and their businesses over that time. We've lost three million jobs over, this, over, over just that first few months of lockdown. People don't have a job, they can't feed their families. They can't provide for their future. And it's going to have a far more devastating effect. So I would look at using, ramping up testing, tracing, and tracking. I would radically roll out proper field hospitals, not the Bradlow's beds that we saw in, at, at NASREC. Proper um, field personnel, proper um, PPE and procuring oxygen, and make sure we can deal with spikes as and when they come up so that nobody who needs medical care in South Africa won't require it. But I think it's going to be devastating for South Africa if we were to go into another lockdown. I really believe it will cause even more harm to South Africa that's already been inflicted and will take what is already going to be a very tough recovery, even if we enact all these reforms, even longer to start to bear fruition. So mask wearing, social distancing, ensuring that we're washing our hands regularly, making sure that we're screening, making sure that we, we adopt the protocols. But for goodness sake, let's, let's keep the wheels of the economy moving. And let's never go back to a situation where we're being told what to wear, how to wear it, and where to buy it from by government edict, because it has caused huge ongoing harm to the South African economy, and I would say to the South African people. Right. Right. We have a question from the media. Please introduce a member of the media. Please could you introduce yourself? Uh, good day, uh, John. I'm from Heldeburg Happening and Happening Media. So, as a millennial, I would like to ask you. You know, sometimes we always focus on the problems of South Africa, but I would like to ask you what. What is the solution as the DA leader? What can you tell the youngsters out there, the millennials out there, uh, what is your vision for this new rainbow nation of ours? Mm. What's the new plan? Sure. Because obviously, m myself as well, um, I've got lots of friends that is, is finding jobs elsewhere in China, doing te teaching jobs in, and elsewhere. But we obviously need to focus more. We, my, my thing is that we need to put the spotlight not on the stage where you are. We need to start putting the spotlight on the people that's in the audience. 
so that we don't need to focus on the problems but actually the solution. So I want to hear some, some solutions from you today. Great, and thank you very much for that very important question. And it is a very important question because I think it speaks uh, to the question that was asked in the corner as well. And that is that there are a significant number of people who are eligible to vote in South Africa who just don't vote. The large majority of them are young South Africans who've given up on the fact that politics is ever a solution to the issues that they face, the problems that they face. And so we've got to give them hope that by investing in the system and, and getting involved, uh, you, know, you can change the circumstances under which you live and that you can build a better future for yourself. And so I think one of the key messages that came out of our policy conference is that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, it doesn't matter what the story of your birth is, you know, that you have a contribution to make in South Africa. And we've got to find a way to unlock the potential that exists in every South African, regardless of what their background is. And I'm really tired of people who just simply write off South Africans because they happen to have a certain skin color. They happen to belong to a certain religion. They have to you know, belong to uh, a certain community. And we've got to bring out the best of all of us. South Africa needs the best of all of us now I would say probably more than it has in since the birth of democracy in our country. And we need to find a way to unlock the potential that exists in each South African and find a way for them to be able to contribute. But that means the first step in that is making sure that people take ownership for their own destiny, understanding that by not voting, you're voting for the status quo, that by opting out of the system, that you're not, you know, that, that you're somehow making a point you're not. You're empowering the very people who are robbing your opportunity and the opportunity of millions of other young people. You're giving them a license to carry on for another five years, another 10 years. And so the change has to start with each and every one of us. And that is why I'm so passionately committed to getting out on the ground, to speak to people, say to them, you've got to get involved. You know, whatever you do, however small the contribution, just do it. Just do it. You know, Robert Kennedy, I think, speaking at UCT, famously said that you know, every time a man or woman speaks out against injustice, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope into the world. And joining each other from a thousand different centers of energy, they can become a wave that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression. I think there's something in that for all of us as South Africans. We need to be those ripples of hope in the political landscape. And opting out of the system is the worst decision that particularly young people can make because you're giving the planning towards your future to the very people who are robbing it from you on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the questions intelligently and fairly. Go well. Thank you. Are we done? Can I? I'm a go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here.